Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be reading this book about ancient Persia. And tonight's video is sponsored by Aspirantum. Aspirantum is a school dedicated to Armenian languages and culture. Based in Yerevan, Armenia, you can sign up for various different language courses in Armenian, Russian, and Persian languages. They offer in-classroom summer courses as well as online courses in Middle Persian, Old Persian, Old Armenian, and Old Slavonic. So if you're interested in learning more about ancient Persian languages, you can sign up for classes over at aspirantum.com and I'll also leave a link down in the description if you just want to click that. And thank you again to Aspirantum for sponsoring today's video. So let's just dive right in. Let's see, we're going to read the introduction, chapter one, Society Dominated by a Privileged Few Chapter 2, Lifestyles of the Rich and Poor Chapter 3, Religious Beliefs and Practices And Chapter 4, Large-Scale Engineering Projects Introduction A short-lived but influential empire The heartland of ancient Persia was the region today occupied by Iran and Iraq it included the plateau of Iran, a large area of rugged hills and valleys northeast of the Persian Gulf. The Persians also controlled Mesopotamia. Lying northwest of the Gulf, this mainly flat region contains the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. It was in Mesopotamia that the world's first cities rose in the 4th millennium BCE, more than 5,000 years ago. A series of peoples and cultures rose and fell in the area over the course of many centuries. These included the Sumerians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and others. In the 6th century BCE, still another people rose to prominence in the region, the Persians. Led by a vigorous and ambitious king Cyrus II, they quickly built a mighty empire. It stretched from the Mediterranean coast in the west to the borders of India in the east. There he is. Under Cyrus's successors, the realm continued to expand. Egypt fell under Persian domination. So did a number of Greek cities in Western Asia Minor, which is the area occupied by modern Turkey. Contacts with the Greeks ultimately proved to be Persia's undoing, however. Persian armies under King Darius I and his son Xerxes invaded mainland Greece in the early 400s BCE. The Greeks delivered them one crushing defeat after another. The Persians suffered more defeats in the century that followed, when Alexander the Great led a Greek army into Persia. In 330 BCE, the last Persian king, Darius III, died while fleeing the invaders. At that moment, the Persian Empire founded by Cyrus ceased to exist, and its lands became part of Alexander's own empire. The Persian Empire did not last long, only a little more than two centuries. Its cultural influence remained strong in the ages that followed, however. In the year 224 CE, a local Iranian leader named Ardas founded the Sasanian dynasty in the region. The Sasanians emphasized old Persian customs and made the old Persian religion supreme. In the 600s, Arab armies defeated the Sasanians and introduced a new religion, Islam. Yet Islamic culture, which still dominates the area, retained strong elements of Sasanian art, architecture, and laws. In this way, some aspects of ancient Persian culture survived into the modern era. Chapter 1. 
society-dominated by a privileged few. The study of ancient Persian society has been a challenge for historians because little information has survived about Persian social, social customs and everyday life. Scholars do, however, know that there are actually two Persian societies. The first was made up of a few thousand well-to-do nobles who ruled the empire. More than 90% of the surviving information concerns their lives and customs. This is because Persian writings were compiled mainly by and for members of the upper classes. Another major source of information consists of descriptions of Persian society in the works of ancient Greek writers. In particular, the 5th century BCE historian Herodotus provided some useful information about Persian social classes and customs, yet he too concentrated primarily on the upper classes. The other Persian society was made up of the millions of people in the lower classes. Whether free or slave, with only a few exceptions, they were extremely poor. Farmhands, animal herders, servants, and laborers, they worked from sunup to sundown for few material rewards. Most died before they were forty and left behind no traces of their existence, not even their name. Moreover, their lives were no different from those of their parents, grandparents, and earlier ancestors. Indeed, the same way of life had existed in the region of Mesopotamia, which is centered in what's now Iraq, for thousands of years. During those many centuries, various ruling classes had come and gone. The Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Babylonians, the Syrians, Medes, and their empires had risen and fallen in and around Mesopotamia. Yet life for most people, often including the rulers themselves, had changed little. Therefore, Persian society was in many ways a continuation of traditional Mesopotamian society. In fact, Herodotus claimed that the Persian upper classes borrowed much of their culture from older Middle Eastern peoples, no race is so ready to adopt foreign ways as the Persian, he wrote. Persian nobles adopted the clothing styles of the Medes, for example. The military and political ideas of the Persians were based closely on those of the Assyrians. Also, Persians ran their large farming estates the same way Babylonian nobles had. The king and his court. Such borrowings can readily be seen in the social customs and rankings of the Persian royal court and privileged upper classes. At the top of the social ladder was the king. He, his family, and his close advisors lived in splendor, in magnificent palaces and mansions. When he held court, the king wore a long purple robe and a crown filled with priceless jewels. He also wore golden chains, earrings, and bracelets. Another luxury was a special purple carpet that only he was allowed to walk on. Furthermore, when anyone, even a noble, approached the king, that person had to lie face down on the floor and avoid eye contact. The Greeks who witnessed this act viewed it as degrading. The king also kept his distance from social inferiors during dinners and parties given in the palace. According to a Greek eyewitness, of the king's guests, some dine outside in full view of the public, others indoors with the king, but even the latter do not dine with the king. There are two apartments opposite one another, and the king breakfasts in one while his fellow diners are in another. The king can see them through the curtain in the doorway, but they cannot see him. Occasionally, however, on a feast day, they all dine in one room with the king, if, as often happens, the king has a drinking party, up to a dozen guests may be called into his presence. They drink with him, but not the same wine, and they sit on the floor while he reclines on a couch with gold feet. The nobles. Occupying the rung directly below that of the king on the social ladder were Persia's chief nobles. Each had a large country estate. 
by law all land in the empire belonged to the king but by custom he gave parcels to the nobles who served as officers in his armies in return each estate owner was obligated to supply a certain number of men and weapons for the military the lord of a bowland supplied one or more archers similarly a noble who lived on a chariot land contributed one or more chariots along with drivers thanks to their money and high social status these nobles enjoyed lives of comfort and privilege they saw themselves as better than others with the exception of the king according to herodotus themselves they consider in every way superior to everyone else in the world the nobles usually viewed one another as equals however this could be seen in their customary greetings when persians meet in the streets said herodotus one can always tell by their mode of greeting whether or not they are of the same rank for they do not speak but kiss their equals upon the mouth not surprisingly both the nobles and king desired to keep the privileged class from growing smaller and weaker the solution was to have as many babies as possible especially boys since society was male dominated herodotus explained every upper class man has a number of wives after prowess in fighting the chief proof of manliness is to be the father of a large family of boys those who have the most sons receive an annual present from the king on the principle that there is strength in numbers women and the lower classes much less is known about the other persian social classes than about the nobles because of the social prominence of boys and men for example little information survives about persian women that men could have multiple wives indicates that women were considered inferior to men also the greek sources claim that persian wives spent most of their time secluded in the home yet evidence from persian sources suggests that women were allowed to keep their personal property after a divorce it is unclear however whether a wife could sue her husband for divorce also royal and other upper class women could own land in contrast lower class women and most lower class men as well could not own land many toiled as field workers maids and cooks on the nobles as wealthy estates a few of these laborers were free people who received small wages most however were either slaves or serfs a persian serf was a free person who was allowed to live and work on a small plot of a nobleman's land in exchange for giving the nobleman a large portion of the harvest always in debt serfs became almost totally dependent on their landlords and often had worse lives than many slaves household slaves for instance were generally well fed and treated humanely on occasion a master would even free a slave the downside was that the slave remained poor and could not own land clearly the persian social system kept the poor masses in their place and allowed a select few to possess nearly all the power prestige and privilege chapter two lifestyles of the rich and poor the huge difference in wealth between persia's nobles and peasants created markedly contrasting lifestyles the poor lived in small homes with no luxuries for them life was a constant struggle simply to keep clothed and fed in contrast the rich dwelled in large comfortable houses with fine furniture and decorations and they had servants who waited on them hand and foot the king's residence most comfortable of all was the persian king he had several palaces to choose from one of the finest was located in the capital of persepolis northeast of the persian gulf the structure rested on a flat stone terrace fourteen hundred feet long and one thousand feet wide two grand staircases led from ground level to the terrace each was twenty-three feet wide and had 111 steps on the great terrace were many splendid buildings 
among them the vast audience hall, or Apadana, where the king greeted his subjects and guests. The palace walls were highly decorated. Everywhere could be seen carved figures and scenes painted in bright colors in imitation of Assyrian and Babylonian art. The king could stroll from building to building in complete safety. This was because a regiment of specially trained soldiers called the Immortals lived right on the premises. In an inscription, King Darius I recognized the importance of his sol soldiers. For no enemy let me fear, he said. As long as his army remained strong, prosperity shall descend upon this house. This grand palace may have been created mainly for the king to conduct state business. His actual residence was probably situated in the town that once surrounded the great terrace. Archaeologists have discovered the foundations of a large house near the palace. The house had many rooms, a large garden, and a small artificial lake. Some experts think this was the private mansion of King Xerxes, who led Persia's second invasion of Greece. Houses of the well to do. Other large townhouses existed near the king's residence. These belonged to the king's leading nobles. Some were high palace officials, military generals, and royal ambassadors. Others had no profession since they did not need a job to make money. All of the nobles made substantial livings from the revenues produced by the large farming estates they owned. Their townhouses were usually constructed of the best bricks available. These were made by combining mud and clay with straw and then baking the mixture into, in a kiln until it hardened. Such houses usually followed a plan in which most of the rooms surrounded a roofless central courtyard. Inside the front door was a roofed foyer. From there, one stepped down into the open courtyard. It was paved, with the stones slanted very slightly to make rainwater flow away into a drain. Among the rooms clustered around the courtyard on the ground floor was a kitchen. It had one or more wood-burning hearths for cooking. The pots and pans were made of copper, the plates and cups of ceramic. Other ground floor rooms included a dining room, bathroom, one or more guest rooms, storage space, and servants' quarters. A flight of stairs led to the second story. There, a corridor led to the family bedrooms. The house was well furnished, with couches, tables, chairs, carpets, and draperies on walls, around doorways, and on window frames. Houses and Jobs of Poor City Folk. Each of these spacious, comfortable houses was surrounded by a high wall made of baked bricks. Such walls provided privacy for the well-to-do people who dwelled in these houses. The walls also separated the rich from the poor. The houses of poor city families, which crowded around the nicer homes, were much smaller, less private, and less comfortable. The average city house consisted of three or four tiny, windowless, and sparsely furnished chambers. These rooms often surrounded a small inner courtyard. It was also common for a house to share one or more walls with neighboring homes. The people who lived in these modest city homes worked in a variety of jobs. Some walked outside the town each morning and toiled in the surrounding fields. Others worked inside the city walls. A few were shopkeepers and potters. Many others worked in small factories, essentially large workrooms where they made carpets, clothes, and other items by hand. Farmers and their huts. The dwellings of poor country folk were even less substantial than those of poor townspeople. Most farmers lived in small huts. Some of these structures were made from sun-dried mud bricks. The sun-dried bricks were less expensive and considerably less sturdy and durable than the baked variety. 
the result was that houses made of sun-dried bricks rapidly began to crumble and needed constant repairs. The farmers who lived in these huts grew a variety of crops. The most important was barley, a type of wheat, part of an old Mesopotamian almanac, which gives tips on growing barley, has survived. It advises the farmer, keep your eye on the man who puts in the barley seed. Let him drop the grain uniformly two inches deep. If the barley seed does not sink in properly, adjust the front of the plow. Do not let the barley bend over on itself. Harvest it at the moment of its full strength. People crushed the barley grains into flour, from which they made a flat bread, one of the staple foods of the Middle East. They also made a thick porridge from barley grains. Other common food crops included beans, peas, lentils, lettuce, figs, and grapes. Hunters of the Marshlands As poor as they were, those farmers who lived in brick houses were fortunate compared to even poorer neighbors. Many peasants, especially in the marshy areas near the rivers, had one-room huts made from plant stems. They collected the stems into bundles. Then they stuck the bottoms of the bundles into holes dug in the ground. After bending the bundles over and tying them together at the top, they filled in the spaces with mats made of reeds or with packed mud. Most of the people who lived in such huts made their living by hunting in the marshes. Mostly they caught fish and water birds, such as herons and ducks. The hunters constructed their boats with the same river reeds that they used to make their houses. When stalking prey, a hunter stood up in his boat. His weapon was a bamboo pole with a metal tip. Little else is known about the poor farmers and hunters who made up the bulk of the population of the Persian Empire. This is hardly surprising. Their houses and few belongings were highly perishable, and over time almost all traces of them disappeared. Meanwhile, the nobles left behind more substantial remains, as well as writings, which later revealed at least a small glimpse of their lifestyle to future generations. Chapter 3. Religious Beliefs and Practices The Persian Empire had no single religion followed by all or most of its inhabitants, because the realm was huge and diverse. It was made up of Medes, Babylonians, Jews, Egyptians, and dozens of other subject peoples conquered by the Persian king and his army. Each of these peoples worshipped one or more of their own gods. The Egyptians, for example, were polytheistic, which means that they worshipped multiple gods. They had a pantheon, or group of gods, that included Ra, Osiris, and Isis. The Jews, by contrast, were monotheists. They worshipped a single god named Jehovah. Persian leaders did not try to overturn these deities or impose their own beliefs on the subject peoples. The native Persian beliefs came from Iran. Once a subject people of the Medes, the Persians had originated in Fars, a small region in southern Iran. They adopted the prevailing religious beliefs of central and southern Iran. At first, the Iranians were polytheistic. They worshipped a series of nature gods called devas. Eventually, however, they began to follow the teachings of a great prophet named Zarathustra. He later became better known by the name the Greeks gave him, Zoroaster. The new faith was essentially monotheistic. All of Persia's kings, their nobles, and an unknown number of their subjects followed it devoutly. The Battle Between Good and Evil the Zoroastrian god was Ahura Mazda, the Wide Lord. He had originally been a sky god, one of several devas worshipped in early Iran. Zoroaster preached that Ahura Mazda was the one true god. Persian artists almost always depict the deity the same way, as a bearded man perched inside a large ring that floated in the sky with the aid of outstretched wings. 
in his left hand he held a smaller ring that signified his authority over earthly kings meanwhile he held his right hand palm up to bless his followers two lightning bolts shot downward from the ring to demonstrate the god's power the greeks identified ahura Mazda, their own god zeus who also wielded lightning bolts sorry for my stutter one of the central tenets of the faith was that Ahura Mazda represented goodness, truth, and light. His followers believed he could bestow peace, prosperity, and good behavior on humans. Part of a surviving prayer to the god asks him to grant the lowly and weak person strength, righteousness, and good thought, whereby he may establish pleasant dwellings in peace. I believe, Mazda, that you can bring this to pass. Another chief concept of the Zoroastrian faith was that Ahura Mazda was engaged in an eternal struggle with evil. That evil took the form of a dark force or being called Ahriman. The evil one's chief followers were the old devas, now seen as wicked demons and spirits. Ahura Mazda's forces of truth or order were always at war with Ahriman's forces of untruth, called the lie or disorder. Good, worthy people who followed the way of truth were known as Ashavans, while corrupt people who followed the lie were called Drugvans. Animals killed in God's name. Very little is known about the actual rituals of Zoroastrian worship in ancient Persia. Of the few surviving sources that describe these rituals, that of Herodotus is the most important. He got some of his facts second-hand, so his account is probably not totally accurate. Still, for the most part, it is informative and illuminating. According to Herodotus, some Zoroastrian priests, there may have been others, were called magi. Apparently a magus always performed or was present during the important ritual of sacrifice. This was an offering made to Ahura Mazda, usually an animal that was killed, to give a god extra nourishment. Herodotus does not say how the animal called the victim was killed. Probably the manner was similar, similar to that of the Greeks, who used a club to stun the beast, then slit its throat with a knife. Before the start of a Persian sacrifice, Herodotus wrote, a man sticks a spray of leaves, usually myrtle leaves, into his headdress, takes his victim to some open place, and invokes the deity. The actual worshipper is not permitted to pray for any personal or private blessing, but only for the king and the general good of the community. When he has cut up the animal and cooked it, he makes a little heap of the softest green stuff he can find, preferably clover, and lays all the meat upon it. This done, a mage setters an incantation over it. Then, after a short interval, the worshipper removes the flesh and does what he pleases with it. In addition to performing sacrifice and other rituals, the Magi indulged in some beliefs and practices that the Greeks and others viewed as odd or extreme. For example, the Magi preached that cattle and dogs were good. In contrast, they insisted many other animals were vile followers of Ahriman, and therefore must be killed. The Magi are a peculiar caste, Herodotus pointed out, quite different from the Egyptian priests, and indeed from any other sort of person. The Egyptian priests make it an article of religion to kill no living creature except for sacrifice, but the Magi not only kill anything with their own hands, but make a special point of doing so ants, snakes, animals, birds, no matter what, they kill them. Burial Customs Another unusual custom practiced by the Magi was the gruesome way they dealt with dead bodies. When a Magus died, his companions left his corpse outside to be eaten by dogs, birds, and other animals. The reason for this is unclear. According to Herodotus, the custom is not spoken of openly and is something of a mystery. What is more certain is that not all Zoroastrian Persians followed this practice. 
Preferring to keep the body intact after death, most people covered it in wax to preserve it, and then buried it. The well-to-do could not afford it to place the waxed body in a stone tomb. King Darius I, for example, was placed in a stone coffin inside a chamber carved into the face of a great vertical cliff. In an inscription, the dead monarch bragged about his widespread conquests. The spear of a Persian man has gone forth afar. The fact that the Magi had one burial ritual and the other Persians another suggests that different versions of the Zoroastrian faith existed. Perhaps the Magi practiced the Orthodox, or strict and conservative version, while the king and nobles followed a less strict version. Any peasants who adhered to the faith may well have followed a third version until further evidence is unearthed. Persian religious practices will remain somewhat mysterious. And chapter 4, Large-Scale Engineering Projects. There we go. Like other ancient peoples, the Persians inherited a way of life that lacked modern technology. People had no electricity and no complex machines. So everyday life was very labor-intensive. All work had to be done by the muscle power of humans or animals. Messages and news had to be carried by hand and word of mouth, for instance. Also, messengers, traders, and other travelers moved through the countryside by foot, donkey, horse, or wagon. Before the Persian Empire, roads in the Middle East were few and mostly made of dirt. When it rained, they turned to mud which impeded travel. The result was that both information and people took weeks and sometimes months to reach distant cities. Obtaining water was another challenge. People in the ancient Middle East possessed no advanced knowledge of pipes and plumbing. This forced them to carry water for drinking, cooking, and bathing by hand from nearby rivers, wells, and other natural sources. Fortunately for the Persians, some of the peoples they conquered had already partially overcome some of these problems. The Assyrians and Babylonians had built a few short paved roads, for example. These peoples and other Mesopotamians had also dug long water channels to irrigate crops. The imitative Persians built on these achievements. Their engineers expanded and improved the older water channels and constructed new ones. The Persian road system was even more impressive. Thousands of miles of well-made roads linked key points in the empire, which made the movement of news, mail, armies, and traders much faster and easier. The Royal Roads Of the many uses for the roads, Carrying troops and military dispatches were most important to the Persian kings. Early on, they realized that it was imperative for armies and royal messages to move swiftly. Otherwise, it would be impossible to maintain order in and control over the many and widely spaced regions of their vast empire. Another obvious benefit of a good road system was economic in nature. Trade goods moved faster and more cheaply from one Persian province to another. The roads built by the Persian kings became known appropriately as the royal roads. Most of them have long since disappeared. Therefore, it is difficult to tell exactly how many there were and where they all began and ended. Luckily for modern researchers, a fair amount of information has survived about two of these roads. One stretched westward from Persepolis to Susa. The other and longer royal road, built by Darius I, continued westward from Susa and went all the way to Sardis in western Asia Minor, not far from Greece. Some 1,600 miles in length, it was the longest road in the world at the time. Archaeologists have studied some of the surviving sections of the road. They found that it was about 20 feet wide and had a surface made of hard-packed gravel. Uniform paving stones lined each side of the highway. 
In addition to the length and high quality of the road itself, travelers benefited from many conveniences. Herodotus traveled on this road on his way to Babylon in the 5th century BCE. He later wrote that posting stations existed every few miles along the way. Such a station had stables to care for horses and donkeys, along with fresh mounts for mail carriers. There were also places for travelers to eat and sleep, and guard posts for security. At intervals all along the road, Herodotus wrote, are recognized stations with excellent inns, and the road itself is safe to travel by, as it never leaves inhabited country. In Lydia and Phrygia, which is in Asia Minor, over a distance of about 330 miles, there are 20 stations. On the far side of Phrygia, one comes to the river Halys. There are gates here, which have to be passed before one crosses the river, and a strong guard post. The total number of stations or post houses on the road from Sardis to Susa is 111. Traveling at the rate of 150 furlongs, or 18 miles a day, a man will take just 90 days to make the journey. Darius's Couriers Although ordinary travelers like Herodotus took 90 days to go from Sardis to Susa, royal couriers could make it much faster. These were special horsemen established by Darius. Their job was to carry military and political dispatches from one section of the empire to another. They rode in relays and refused to stop for anything or anyone. As a result, they sped from Susa to Sardis, or vice versa, in only fifteen days, then seen as an incredible feat. In Herodotus's words, There is nothing in the world which travels faster than these Persian couriers. The whole idea is a Persian invention, and works like this. Riders are stationed along the road, equal in number to the number of days the journey takes, a man and a horse for each day. Nothing keeps these riders from covering their allotted stage in the quickest possible time. Neither snow, rain, heat, nor darkness. The first, at the end of the stage, passes the dispatch to the second, the second to the third, and so on along the line. Canals and Aqueducts Another impressive engineering feat completed by Darius was a canal that linked the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea and Indian Ocean beyond. It covered a distance of about 125 miles. The canal increased trade and prosperity in Egypt and Palestine, and it remained in use off and on for more than a thousand years. Darius' son Xerxes also built a large waterway. Just before he invaded Greece in 480 BCE, Xerxes ordered his engineers and workers to dig a canal through part of the Athos Peninsula in northern Greece. Herodotus claimed that two warships traveling side by side could pass through at the same time. A different kind of large-scale water project overseen by the Persians was to maintain and improve the underground aqueducts built by earlier Mesopotamian peoples. An aqueduct is an artificial channel that carries water from a lake or other source to distant fields and towns. The Persians called such a channel a kariz. The Arab name Khan is better known. I think that's how you say that. To construct a Khan, the workers dug two vertical shafts. Then they climbed down and dug a horizontal shaft that connected the bottoms of the vertical ones. The water flowed through this horizontal shaft. To lengthen the channel, they sank more vertical shafts and continued to connect them. Some of these waterways were many miles long and supplied badly needed water to irrigate fields and parched areas. Though the Persians did not invent these aqueducts, they introduced them to less developed areas of their huge realm. Their effective use of massive amounts of manpower in large-scale engineering projects remained unmatched until the Romans surpassed them a few centuries later. And that's going to be the end of our book for tonight. 
thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night. Good night.